Uh, okay, <laughs> for everyone who's here, I'll start. Um, uh, maybe people have stopped coming because it was so discombobulated the last few times. But I'm not sure if it's going to be better this time, but we'll see. I'm a little bit flustered these days. But anyway, I'll just start talking about the aesthetic, unless there are questions about that happened before. All right. Um, so first, like I said, I'll start with where we are in the book. Um, so remember, everything we're re reading is part of the doctrine of elements. And it has two parts, transcendental aesthetic and transcendental logic. And now, in today's reading, Kant explained why the transcendental logic should be divided into two parts, which is called the analytic and the dialectic. And uh, the last part of today's reading was the introduction to the transcendental analytic, I believe, or is that the next one? In any case, this is roughly speaking very are, the beginning of the transcendental analytic. And, um, you know, what is the difference between the transcendental analytic and the transcendental dialectic? Well, just like very briefly, the transcendental analytic is the logic of truth, whereas the transcendental dialectic is the logic of illusion, or that is, is a criticism of transcendental logical illusion. So these two parts correspond to the two parts of metaphysics that I mentioned at the beginning, right? The transcendental analytic is going to contain the positive part where he explains why is how a certain kind of metaphysics is possible. And then the transcendental dialectic is going to contain the other part where he explains why, well, it, it's really, so I could say why a certain kind of metaphysics is not possible, but it's a little bit more complicated than that because he wants to explain why, although it's not possible, we tend to think it's possible. We tend to think we're doing it, right? That's why it's about illusion. Okay, so that's where we are now. But um, uh, at first, I'm going to go back and talk about the uh, things from the aesthetic, unless there's questions about this. So, um, so once again, there's three things that I want to talk about today. Once again, I hope I get to all three of them. But the first one is Kant's argument. In the transcendental aesthetic. Right, because remember last time I kind of was trying to explain what his conclusion means. Namely, the conclusion that space and time are the pure forms of sensible intuition. The pure forms of our sensible intuition. Um, um, us human beings. But the truth is, I think, Kant doesn't think that we could, we could actually encounter a being that had a different form of um intuition because we know this one form of pure form of intuition and uh um we know it's only an example but we can't understand any other possible examples <laughs> this is actually in a way a key point of the book but we'll talk about this more when we get to the section of phenomena and noumena Thing. But just like for now, I think like so so um we'll we'll never know whether another form of uh, pure form of sensible intuition is possible, according to Kant. We don't know and we'll never know. Um in fact he says at one point it could be that you know all finite beings have this same form of um, sensible intuition. 
Um, we don't know whether another one is possible, let alone whether it's actual. We never will know. And so that means that any like space aliens that we encountered or whatever would also have space and time as the form of their intuition, sensible intuition. They might have senses completely different from us, right? They might sense radio waves or, you know, chemical signals or who knows, right? But what they sense using those senses would be in space and time, just like the objects of all sensing intuition. Right. So anyway, that was about what I talked about last time, but I didn't explain how, or I barely started to explain why, how comp makes you, you can be sure that that's what space and time are, you know, the pure form of our sensibility. So that was the first thing I wanted to talk about. The second thing I wanted to talk about is, these notes are not my final notes. Um, things in themselves. This is an issue that's going to keep, uh, it's going to be with us throughout the entire book, what Kant means by things in themselves and how you should understand that. But uh, it comes up, I think, for the first time in a big way in the, in the aesthetic. So I want to talk about that, an initial discussion of that. And then the final thing is transcendental logic. Um, to try to explain what that is and to say what I can about the meaning of this word transcendental. Um, it's surprisingly hard to figure out what Kant means by transcendental. It's surprising because he uses the word so much. <laughs> He does say some things about what he means, and one of the main ones is in today's reading in the introduction to the transcendental logic. Um, but it's pretty hard to put it together into something that fits all the different uses of it. I remember once talking to someone who's like a Kant uh, scholar and asking her what she thought transcendental meant, and she said, uh, well, I think it's just uh, like Kant's kind of trademark word that he adds on to the beginning of everything. <laughs> now, I mean, uh, on the one hand, if that were really true, and I'm not sure she was serious, but if that were really true, that would be a like um, big problem with Kant as a philosopher, right? Like a philosopher should not use a key technical term that way. <laughs> should mean something. <laughs> so, I mean, if that were really what Kant was doing with it, you kind of start asking whether it was worth trying to understand Kant. Um, but on the other hand, the fact that even perhaps as a joke to suggest that is like reflect how difficult it is to pin down exactly what it means. So, but I'm going to try to say what I can. I think I actually kind of understand what it means, but it's not that easy to explain, which is also, uh, fits in with the fact that Kant doesn't explain it very well because it's not very easy to explain. So I'll, I'll try to say what I can about it when we get to this point. Um, okay, but I'm so I'm going to start with this one, however. Um, okay, so like the main, um, I have this bookmark and then I took the page. Um, so, like, the main argument, the transcendental aesthetic, although it's much shorter than transcendental logic, is a pretty long section. It's got all kinds of stuff in it, right? But the main argument takes place over just a few pages. Like, just, um, you know, this page, this page, and the beginning of this page. <laughs> Right, there's four points, and those four points are part of what Kant calls the metaphysical exposition. Well, I should say there's one for space, and then there's another one for time. But the one I was just showing was the one for space. Those four points make up the part, or almost all of the, the short section that Kant entitles metaphysical exposition of this concept that is of the concept of space. 
And this, similarly, there's another one for time and the points um, match up in the two, right? Except for, so there's a little wrinkle. So in the A edition, there were five points in the metaphysical exposition of the concept of space. So like, if you look down in Kemp Smith, uh, below the, the line on these pages, the, the A edition text is down here. So in the A edition, um, there was, uh, so there are four points in the B edition. The extra points in the A edition that you took out came in here. So in the A edition, it was point three. Um, and what happened to it? Well, so this title also was something he added in the B edition. And in the B edition, he also added a new section called Transcendental Dental Exposition of this concept. And basically, uh, what was in this point and more like to put in this new section. So that's for space. For time, he actually just left all five points. <laughs> Um, it, that he had in the A edition, in the B edition. And if you look at the beginning of the transcendental uh, exposition of the concept of time, he says, so this is page B48, page 76 in Kemp Smith. I may here refer to number three, where for the sake of brevity, I have placed under the title of metaphysical exposition, what is properly transcendental, right? So in other words, in the metaphysical, in the transcendental exposition of time in the B edition, he says, uh, oh, what should go in this section? I just left up here. <laughs> um, so like why he did that for time and not for space, I'm not sure actually, it's a good question. Um, he, you know, uh, he didn't really finish revising the, for the A edition for the B edition. I think he was under some kind of deadline, uh, you know, so like changes stop at a certain point in the book. Um, but I don't think that could explain this because it's all like, you know, like he, he says what he's doing. So, right, it's obviously in a finished state. I don't know why. Um, but in any case, I'm mostly going to talk about the space one. Uh, um, but if you compare it to the time one, that's the only thing to be careful about. Okay, so what is the argument in these four points? Um, and what's the difference in a metaphysical and a transcendental exposition. Um, so I think, although then this is like data that has to go into this question about what transcendental means, um, I think it's pretty, pretty clear that the division of labor between these two is the following. The metaphysical edition, uh, exposition shows that space, for example, is a pure form of sensible intuition. The transcendental ex exposition explains why synthetic a priori knowledge is therefore possible. And that's why, like, if you look at the point that was eliminated in the B edition, it starts the apodictic certainty, so apodictic means like demonstrative. It's just like the Greek equivalent for, for Latin demonstrative. So the apodictic or demonstrative certainty of all geometrical propositions and the possibility of their a priori construction is grounded in this a priori necessity of space. Right, so that's talking about the way synthetic a priori knowledge, namely mathematical, 
synthetic a priori knowledge can be based on what we're showing about space here. Whereas the, the beginning of the transcendental exposition in the B edition is, I understand by transcendental exposition, the explanation of a concept as a principle from which the possibility of other a priori synthetic knowledge can be understood. Right, so this point began by saying something about how synthetic a priori knowledge is grounded in space. Um, in the B edition, he moved it to the transcendental exposition, and the transcendental exposition says a transcendental exposition explains how synthetic a priori knowledge is possible on the basis of some representation. So I think that's why I say I think it's pretty clear what the division of labor here is. The question about why this one is therefore called metaphysical and this one is called transcendental, I won't address yet. I guess, I mean, I should say one thing right away about transcendental. Like I said, it's hard to understand what it means, but it usually turns up in a contrast with something else, right? Like transcendental versus metaphysical. Sometimes it's transcendental versus formal, like formal logic versus transcendental logic. Sometimes it's transcendental versus empirical. Usually it's easier to understand those contrasts individually than to figure out what transcendental means in general. So like that's my advice when reading the book. Um, if you're like trying to figure out what transcendental means, to focus on what context, what contrast he's using in, in a particular place, and that's often easier to understand. So here, without understanding exactly what transcendental or metaphysical mean in general, we you know we have understood what the difference between a metaphysical exposition and a transcendental exposition is. This shows what kind of representation is. And this shows why a representation like that can be the basis of synthetic a priori knowledge. So anyway, so I, uh, I, I think actually, as I said last time, this is pretty easy to understand once you have this in place, and which is why this section is shorter and in the place on time, you just left it as one little bullet. Right? Um, so this is the argument I really wanna talk about, these four points. Um, and so the first point is space is not an empirical concept which has been derived from outer experiences. For in order that certain sensations be referred to something outside me, that is to something in another region of space from that in which I find myself, and similarly, in order that I may be able to represent them as outside and alongside one another, and accordingly as not only different, but as in different places, the representation of space must be presupposed. The representation of space cannot therefore be empirically obtained from the relations of outer experience. So, this is something that I said, I think, kind of like vaguely at the end last time, but it's I, this this is the way i understand it um imagine trying to learn from experience that different things are in different directions so um you know uh learning something on experience means taking one case checking that it's true in that case, check, taking another case, checking that it's true in that case, et cetera, right? Like the way we learn that all bodies are him. Um, but in order to do that, you already have to have the different cases separated from each other as different. If you're not sure whether it's the same thing you're looking at twice or a new thing, then you can't start doing that. So that's why Kant is saying space can't be an empirical representation because in order to represent things as external to me and to each other, that is different from each other um, and different even though they're qualitatively the same, right? I think that's important here. So like, I mean, if all bodies were exactly the same as each other, and yet, and they were among other things, they were all heavy. 
Well, I mean, this is a little bit hard to imagine because I would have to, my body would have to be one of them. So they would all have to be like, kind of like that movie about John Malkovich. <laughs> Every body would have to be my body. But I don't know. Anyway, without trying to figure out how this would actually work, if everybody was exactly the same and they were all heavy, um, I could still check that all bodies are heavy by checking one after another because even though they're identical to each other, they're in different places. So they're different bodies. But um, if I didn't already know that different things, things in different directions are different things, then I wouldn't know that I wasn't just looking at the same body over and over. Because they're all the same as each other. And they're certainly all, they're, the whole point is that they're the same as each other in the respect that I'm interested in. They're all heavy. Right? So I'm seeing heaviness here, heaviness here, heaviness here. And I know they're not the same heaviness over and over again because they're in different directions at the same time. Um, so, um, so that, according to Kant, is enough to show that space is not an empirical representation. Now, I mean, so let, remember, we're trying to show, right this way, what it is we're trying to show. We're trying to show that space is an a priori intuition. Pure intuition. That is your form of intuition. Um, so this argument, number one, goes to this, right? Showing that it's a priori. And so does number two. Now, I mean, it's a question whether number one and number two are um, um, each one on its own sufficient to prove this point, according to Kant, or whether for some reason you need both of them. And um, I'm not sure. And uh, different readers of Kant disagree with each other. <laughs> so I'm not gonna try to settle that, but I just try to, try to explain how point two works. Um, I mean, not that I don't have any thought about this, but I don't wanna go into it. So I'll just try to explain how point two works. So it's also supposed to show that space is an a priori representation. I mean, if there is a difference, Rate one starts out space is not an empirical concept, and two starts space is a necessary a priori representation. So there, I mean, there's several differences. One is that one is phrased negatively, whereas two is positive. Um, one mentions a concept, whereas two just mentions a representation, and two mentions necessary, which one doesn't. So if you want to explain why you need both of them, that's what you would have to focus on. But I'm not going to try to explain. I'm just going to try to explain how two works. So two says, space is a necessary a priori representation, which underlies all outer intuitions. We can never represent to ourselves the absence of space, though we can quite well think it as empty of objects. So that's the key point in the argument. We can never represent to ourselves the absence of space, though we can quite well think it as empty as uh, empty of objects. So um, um, this is supposed to show that the representation of space is prior to the representation of any empirical object. Because, so I mean, this is supposed to show that the representation of space has to be in place before we can learn anything from experience. That's what number one is supposed to show. Number two is supposed to show that the representation of space must be in place um, before we can represent any external thing at all. Now, I mean, um, <laughs> 
I guess the question is, well, like who says we, well, I mean, one question is, is he making a distinction between represent at the beginning of the sentence and think at the end of the sentence? Um, it's tempting to think that he is, but um, I have not been able to get anywhere with that. Um, but uh, leaving that aside, the question is, okay, who says we can never represent to ourselves the absence of space? And on the other hand, who says we can quite well think it as empty of objects? So, I mean, um, one thing this could mean is try as hard as you can. You can't imagine that there's no space, which seems reasonable. It's hard to imagine that there's no space. <laughs> um, but the only problem with that is that seems to be a posteriori. Right? Like, as I said before, you know, like internal ghostly experience is still a posteriori. You, you, maybe if you try a little harder, you will be able to. <laughs> so, um, so it seems like that is not a suitable understanding of what he's saying. And then um, on the other hand, the other part, we can quite well think it as empty of objects. I mean, that's also kind of weird. Like, are you, I mean, so like if the if the choice of the word think there means anything, I I, get, I mean, I guess it does mean something. It's uh, like you certainly can't imagine space as empty of objects because you'd be imagining nothing, right? That is, if you think of imagining as as a kind of as Kant is going to define it later. Um, intuitive representation of an object, even when it isn't present. Right? So it's like sensing an object, but the object's not present, basically. Well, you know, you can't sense space as empty of objects. It's like sensing nothing. <laughs> um, so, you, so it's not clear that you can imagine it either. Um, so like there's, so like trying to understand this in terms of building up a mental picture, sort of on one hand, you can't, and on the other hand, you can, is not very, um, easy to understand. And, um, I think the right way to think of it rather is a matter of abstraction from a complete representation of something in space. So, I mean, first of all, do people understand what I mean by abstraction? Because this is like, I shouldn't assume people do. No, yes. Empiricists. Yeah, empiricists use this term a lot, yeah. So, but some people were shaking their heads. So like to, so first of all, abstract is really the same word as abstract. Just has an ad instead of so. To abstract means to like take away. So what are we taking away? And so the, the base of the idea is that we have like a concrete, complete um well representation or idea, as the empiricists would say, of something. And you want to focus on just part of it and not the rest. So you take off the part that you want to focus on and leave the rest. Or maybe you take off the rest and leave the part you want to think about. I think people usually think about it the, the other way, but it doesn't make any difference, right? The point is really what you're doing is like separating some part of the complete representation and just focusing on that. Right? Like, so for example, if you have um, a whole bunch of different human beings, you can abstract 
the character of humanity in general um, by focusing just on what they have in common and ignoring the rest. So, I mean, there's a lot more to say about abstraction and whether abstraction is even possible. Right? Barclay said it's not possible. Um, and you at some point think you're trying to agree with them, but it doesn't seem like you really agree with them. But in any case, um, uh, that's 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 what abstraction is supposed to be like, right? So when I say that this this argument is really about abstraction rather than imagining um, kind of a mental picture of space with nothing in it, um, or of there being no space, I think this is the way you can understand it. So like, suppose you are imagining or seeing some body like this table. So like. On the one hand, you can quite easily understand what the space the table is um, in is like in abstraction from the fact that what's in it is a table. Something else could be in it. Right? So, like, you can ignore the, the fact that what's in this space is a table. Um, and that's the sense in which you can quite well think of space as empty of objects. That is, you can think of only the space and ignore what's actually in it. Professor. So um, you can try to say what the table is without the spaces. Professor. Right, like what characteristics does the table have? Oh, someone asked me a question on Zoom. Yeah, I was I was just curious. The way I'm getting it, the way I've read it, and the way I think I'm getting it from you, is it that it's kind of like a singling out of a focal point, and like abstracting that and focusing on that thing, or that character, or that characteristic of a thing. Yeah, I mean, it has something to do with partial attention or something like that. Different people explain differently how it's possible. Kant has his own way of understanding how it's possible, but I think yeah, I mean. It's it's something like paying attention to one characteristic without the other. Okay, okay, cool, thank you. So like what I'm saying about the table is that um, all the properties of the table are properties spread, spread over the space that it's in. None of them can be understood without the space. Right, so, um, so in that sense, you don't have to try to like imagine um, space being absent. You just have to pay attention to what your representation of a thing in space is like to realize that all its properties are spatial and that without the space, it's not there at all. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess you could say, even though I'm focusing mostly on the space, side of this, it should be clear how something like this could be said about time as well. Right? Like in this case, you know, I have to know that um, the same time is not going to come back again over and over again <laughs> in order to start checking things one at a time to see what holds each one in uh, each case. And similarly, like if you ask, what is the table without its temporal spread, so to speak? It's also um, like all its properties are also temporal. You can't understand it, what the table is outside of time. Um, Okay, so like, so I mean, these arguments don't aim in exactly the same direction, and therefore it's certainly plausible that Hopkins thinks you need both of them for the full conclusion, but he doesn't quite explain that, if that's true. Right? He just gives them one next to the other. They both definitely tend to, to establish that space is um, not something we could have picked up an experience from experience because we have to already um, represent things as in space before we can experience them. Um, 
just from just from slightly different points of view. So, like I said, that goes to this part. Of it. Are there questions about that so far? More questions from Zoom? No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, it's better when I'm doing this hybrid thing to speak up rather than using the chat. I, I mean, not that anyone tried to use the chat because I don't necessarily notice, like look at the chat often enough. Um, all right, so um, so that's points one and two. What about points three and four? So, um, so points three and four are go towards this part, you know, yeah, this like Pat doesn't say that. And you know, this is this is also is a general issue in this book. Like there's there's a lot of structure in it that Kant doesn't call attention to. <laughs> and you just have to kind of figure out, right? Like as opposed to Hegel, where everything is arranged in a table of contents where there's like you know, three chapters, and each chapter has three subchapters, and each subchapter has three sub, right? And like this, I mean, sometimes in Hegel there can be problems figuring out what the structure is supposed to be too. But on the whole, he hits you over the head with it. Whereas Kant has little things going on that he just like doesn't even mention. There's two points like this, and there's two points like this, but he doesn't say that. Like you have to pay attention to realize that's happening. Um, and it could be important. I mean, I never tried to figure this out, but as we'll see, there's four headings of the categories, and so this number four might be really important. Um, and the categories are divided into two groups, just like this. Somehow, maybe that correlates with this. I don't know. Anyway, if it does, Kant doesn't give any hint. He doesn't even tell you that he's doing it. So, um, okay, so but points three and four. So, I mean, so this is a little bit harder to understand or maybe a lot harder to understand because I guess the distinction between concept and intuition is harder to understand than the distinction between a priori and a posteriori. Um, and the things he says in points three or four are, um, are more difficult. But let me just read the beginning of section of, of point three. Space is not a discursive or as we say, general concept of relations of things in general, but a pure intuition. So what would it mean if space were a discursive or general concept? So remember, like a discursive or general concept, but I mean, there isn't any other kind of concept, right? So discursive or general concept is, is like, that's what concepts are, they're discursive and general. And discursive, um, uh, doesn't mean the same thing as general, but they go together. In general, it means you're done feeling. So like, a concept is general, so like the concept dog, here's the concept dog, and, um, you know, many possible different things could correspond to the concept dog. This dog, that dog, uh, the concept dog by itself doesn't tell you how many of those there are, if there are any. Well, since it's an empirical concept, and this is actually important, since it's an empirical concept, we acquired it from experience. So if we acquired it correctly from experience, there at least were dogs, even if there aren't any anymore. But, um, but the concept itself doesn't even say that really, right? It's just it's just a rule something could conform to. But what I'm saying about acquiring from experience is that like to acquire a rule like that correctly from experience is to find instances of it and learn from them about the rule. Right? So we just so we just have a rule that any number of things or no things could correspond to. Um 
and uh, and the rule doesn't say anything about any of these cases except what they all have in common that they're dogs. So I think so. First of all, Kant thinks there is a concept like that of space. Remember that the title of this section is metaphysical exposition of this concept. <laughs> there is a concept. But the concept of space, again, is something that any number of different things can correspond to. What are the different things? Well, there's spaces, right? Like this space, this space, this space. Um, so uh, uh, I think think of this concept of applying to both one, two, and three-dimensional spaces. <laughs> Right, so um, 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 so like here's point five in the A edition. Space is represented as an infinite given magnitude, a general concept of space which is found alike in a foot in an and in an L cannot determine anything in regard to magnitude. Right, a foot and an L, an L, I don't know how long an L is, but it's some measure of distance, right? So like a foot and an L are both examples of spaces, just as this dog and this dog are both examples of dogs. So there is a concept like that, but Kant says that concept is not space. That's the concept of spaces. And what are spaces? Spaces are parts of space. So the next sentence in point three is, for in the first place, we can represent to ourselves only one space. And if we speak of diverse spaces, we mean thereby only parts of one and the same unique space. So, I mean, that part's not true of dogs, right? Like, um, if we speak of dogs, we don't mean parts of one and the same unique dog. <laughs> um, why is space like that and dogs are not? Well, um, okay, so, there's different ways that two dogs could be different from each other. Like this dog could be bigger than this dog, or smaller or a different color or whatever. But suppose, again, like I was saying, I was imagining this with all bodies. Suppose that all these dogs were like exactly the same size, color, et cetera. Right? That is, that they were like that, what Leibniz would call indiscernible. Um, so Leibniz says, then there would only be one of them. Kant says, um, and he'll try to explain why Leibniz made this mistake. Kant says, what do you mean there would only be one of them? They wouldn't be in the same space at the same time. So they wouldn't be the same dog. If you want to go to the space, Right, so the spaces, um, um, well, like as far as their quality goes, they all are identical. Space is homogeneous. Well, real space isn't homogeneous, like the general relativity or whatever. But <laughs> in this world, thinking like Kant, I think the geometry is correct. Space is homogeneous. Right, so the concept of space is found equally in a foot and an L, and um, that's all there is to a foot or an L, as far as being a space. Okay, it's it's they're the same. Um, well, okay, they could be a different shape and different size, but um, um. A different shape really means like a different way of ordering other spaces. 
So now, like we've said something about which space this is, but only by pushing back the question is like which space is this, which space are these? <laughs> um, so like what when we when we try to explain what the difference between the different spaces, like what makes this a different space than this one? Um, like as in that imaginary case with the dogs, and the ends were left with really like really nothing to say about, it, or only an infinitely long thing to say about. It. And like the thing about it being infinitely long is basically what Spinoza says. Right? Spinoza says that um, like any particular mode of extension is what it is only by virtue of infinitely many other finite modes of extension. I'm speaking like have people have 100 B? I know not everyone has, but no, no one has 100 B. Oh, some have, some have. Oh, 100 B is rational, so 100 oh, yeah. is empiricist. Yeah, so like anyway, the one that has Spinoza in it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, Spinoza, so Spinoza says like. The divine mind contains um, an infinitely complicated representation of each individual space. And that's why um, the divine mind can know particular parts of extension. But our mind, which is actually just a part of the divine mind, according to Spinoza, doesn't contain that infinitely long chain. And so Spinoza says, yeah, we, don't, we only have a a confused impression of individual parts of extension. But again, Kant says, no, like Spinoza is going wrong because he's not noticing, he's thinking of space as a general concept and asking how can it be particularized down, right? How can we add characteristics of it to get down to some individual space? Right? Like if these two dogs were different breeds of dogs, and we might imagine that what we have to do is like have a more a fuller concept. The difference, these two concepts are both like concepts of subspecies of the concept dog, right? Like this is the concept of German pepper, and this is the concept of poodle. And then we say, oh, we know these are different because this one's a German shepherd and this one's a poodle. But um, uh, so Spinoza is thinking that spaces are like that. And we and in order to talk about this particular space, we have to get a concept that applies only to it. And how can we do that? We have to give an infinitely complicated description of all the other spaces and how they surround us. Um, whereas Kant is saying, um, No, the whole point of space is that the parts of it um, are not picked out by different concepts. Anything could be in any one of them. And therefore, space, so this is the concept space. But space itself is not like spaciness, right? What you might call like what the concept space is the concept of, of you know the quality of being a space. Space itself is not that. Space itself is um, a whole in which parts that have this quality can be distinguished from one another. How can they be distinguished from one another? Well, um, because we know a priori that the same thing can't be in two different directions at the same time. So, um, um, so that's a proof that our representation of space itself is not a concept. doesn't relate to its object by way of um, some other means that have to be added on 
to get down to the specific. It relates to its object directly, that is, it's an intuition. Um, so, like, that's the way the argument runs. Now, I mean, you step back from that and say, well, wait, you mean our representation of space is more than an intuition is showing up on the scene? No. So now it sounds like we're saying this, that like, here's our intuition of space in our mind. And it represents this one thing out here, space itself. And then somehow this thing is such that it makes it possible to distinguish different places in it. Um, so, like, I think Kant's, Kant talks that way up to a certain point in the argument, but of course he doesn't mean that, because we know that in the end he thinks space is the pure form of external sense. It's not an, ob it's not an external object at all. Right? That is, like, how can there be this um, um, entity that doesn't have any of its own properties and doesn't affect us. And yet somehow we're able to know something about it, namely that it has these different parts that can be distinguished from each other by direction and distance. Um, and that we can be affected in different ways by, by, by whatever is there. Well, like, um, you know, to say that his opponents or like previous people are, are you know, either have to say that there really is no such thing or that there is such a thing or there is such an entity, but it's not a thing. Like it has no quality of its own um, and it doesn't affect us, but somehow magically we know all this stuff of it. So, um, so it turns out that what's really going on here is You know, we have an intuition of this dog, but part of it is what's common to all the other intuitions. And this is the pure intuition. And what is it an intuition of? Well, it isn't. Like by itself, it's not. Right? We're not representing anything just using this. Every actual thing is something in space that we sense in space. Um, but again, by abstraction, <laughs> we focus on this, this part. And um, we see that um, um, I guess I, could put, I should put it this way. We know there is a part like this, right? That is, we know that all our sense, external sensible intuitions have something in common because they're all acts of our own faculty, the way we can be affected. Um, if space were a general concept like this, then uh, um, that is, if, if, Taking up space were like if having if, if the space of this dog were like I don't know how to put it, what it would be like. But um, yeah, like if the place of this dog were like the breed of this dog. Uh, like an extra concept that we we're using to specify which dog we're talking about, then whatever this was, it wouldn't have to do with space. But this argument shows that that's not the case. Um, 
that space has to be something we have before she can distinguish individual spaces yeah. and then form a concept of what they have in common, the concept of spaciness. And what could that be that's there before we form any concept? And yet um, is not a way that something external has affected us. And the answer is it's this pure form of intuition. Um, all right, I feel like I could have explained that better. I feel like I could understand this better. Um, And point four is, is really about the other, the same thing kind of from the other direction. Right, it's like point three says, space is not a general concept because space itself is, um, our representation of space is not a general concept because space itself, whatever it is, is something that's one. And when we talk about individual spaces, we're dividing it into parts. And point four says space, uh, our representation of space is not a general concept because um, uh, space has infinitely many um, um, Space, a representative of space contains in itself infinitely many different possibilities for how it can be divided up or how it can be filled. Um, well, maybe that's not the right way to put it. Yeah, okay, sorry. So, I mean, so this is so like if our representation of space were a general concept, then like the concept dog, it wouldn't say anything about, like the concept dog doesn't say anything about how many dogs there are, or even if there are any. But our representation of space already contains the fact that there are infinitely many spaces. Um, so, um, again, like the only way a concept could do that is if the concept itself were infinitely complicated, like the concept of space that Spinoza thinks that exists in the divine mind. But um, since our concepts are not like that, um, um, space is not a general concept, but rather an intuition. Okay, I think, like I said, three and four are harder to understand than one and two, and I feel like I under I explained one and two better than I did three and four, perhaps not coincidentally. Um, but I don't have time to say more about that unless there are questions about it. Because um, I want to get to those other two things I want to talk about. Um, Um, I mean, like you might ask, how do we know that we don't have infinitely complicated concepts? 
why this basically says we do, right? but we just haven't succeeded in clarifying it for ourselves, right? So all that we have left is analysis, what we have to do is turn to life. Um, I think, but I'm afraid this is somehow circular. It has to be, it somehow has to be straightened out. But, I mean, or anyway, the question is, which of these comes first? Like, the idea of a being with infinitely complicated concepts is the idea of a being that doesn't need pure forms of intuition. It doesn't need, doesn't have sensible intuition at all. It's able to give a complete rule according to which the actual object of its representation exists from within its own nature, which again is what Spinoza thinks God can do and what Leibniz thinks we all do. Only we just don't perceive it clearly, right? Um, so, um, so the question is, which one does Todd think we know first, and how do we know that one without the other? They don't have a great answer yet. Are there questions about this before I go on? Okay, because what I'm going to talk about now is something that I I feel like I feel I'm clearer on than this, but uh, I think. It may be harder to follow, um, which is this thing about things in themselves, right? So, Todd is always making this distinction between things in themselves and appearances or phenomena. Um, appearances are are shining in, shining in, are shining in. Um, you know, it should mean the same thing as phenomena. Uh, they both have. They both come from verbs meaning to shine. <laughs> um, just one is German and the other is Greek. Um, Sometimes, however, Kant seems to make a distinction between appearances and phenomena. But so, but for now, I'm going to assume that they're equivalent, and um, they're 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 both distinguished as against things in themselves. And Kant says the objects of our knowledge or cognition are all phenomena or appearances. They aren't things in themselves. So. Um, what does this mean? So like, okay, here's two ways you could think about it, which I'm gonna say both have to be wrong, <laughs> but they might seem to exhaust the possibilities. And uh, a lot of serious interpreters of Kant have favored one or the other. So one way of looking at it is that, um, um, okay, so here's us, like, here's our mind. And here's the object of our cognition. These are phenomena. But the phenomena are just the appearances to our mind caused by something else. And the something else is the things in themselves. So things in themselves would be a, would be a kind of thing, and phenomena would be another kind of thing. And like things in themselves are obviously a better kind of thing, <laughs> right? Like why in themselves means this is maybe not so clear, but the idea is that things in themselves would be things that really exist, whereas phenomena are just the effects of those things on us. 
That's one way of looking at it. But here's another way of looking at it. Here are things in themselves. And each one of them has a way, has like an aspect, but in which it appears to us. So there's really only like one kind of thing. Um, but those things you can either look at as they are in themselves, that is, so to speak, as they really are, um, or you can look at them the way they appear to us, and then you're considering them as phenomena. Um, so here, the relationship between things in themselves and phenomena is cause and effect. And here, the relation is um, like thing to its aspect. Oh, no, this is probably off the Zoom screen. Oh, no, it's not. OK. Thing to its aspect or property. Right, it has the property of appearing to us in a certain way. You could also say substance to accident. If you want to use technical metaphysical terminology. Okay, so um Both of these pictures can explain why Kant sometimes says things like, um, we can't deny that we can think things themselves because then we would be absurdly committed to saying they're of appearances without something that appears, right? Like in this picture, we would say, well, you know, there can't be appearances, namely effects on us caused by things in themselves, unless there are things in themselves to cause them. In this way, we would say, well, there can't be a way that things to appear, appear to us unless there's a way they are in themselves. So, I mean, broadly speaking, however, the problem with both of these pictures is that we remember we started off by saying all the objects are knowledge recognition are appearances or phenomena. We don't know things in themselves. But it looks like in both these pictures, we know quite a bit about things in themselves. In this picture, we know that they exist, that they're different from the phenomena, and that they're causes of the phenomena. On this picture, we know that they exist and that um, they have a particular way of appearing to us but that that doesn't exhaust their nature or something like that, that they have more to themselves than just the way they appear to us. Um, so um, both of those things are knowing a lot about things in themselves. Right, like, I mean, if I know there's something under here that's making a noise, but I can't see it, I still know a lot about it. I know it's under here, it's making a noise, right? Um, similarly, like if I if if I know that there's something behind the appearances that's causing them, I know a lot about it. I know that it's behind the appearances and it's causing. Them. Um, moreover, it's worse because these particular relations of cause and effect and substance and accident are like are on coming up Kant's table of categories and. Um, and aside from that broad claim that we don't know things in themselves, he um, especially emphasizes the more specific claim that we can't apply the categories to things in themselves. Right. So without explaining what the categories are yet or anything like that, just the fact that cause and effect and substance and accident are on the list 
means we shouldn't be able to regard things in themselves as causes or as substances, according to Kant. And yet, in one of these pictures, we have one, and the other, we have the other. Therefore, I think most, both of these pictures must be wrong. Or, of course, Kant must just be inconsistent. And a lot of post-Kantians do say Kant is inconsistent in this regard, right? So it's typical to say, oh yeah, Kant is pretty good, except for that stupid thing about things in themselves. So like Hegel says that basically, I mean, maybe Hegel is a little bit no, more nuanced, but um, uh, Husserl says that, like a lot of people reading Kant say, oh yeah, but the thing about things in themselves, that doesn't make sense, right? And you can see why, like, you might think even if you come up with a different picture, they're all going to have the same problem. Like you're saying something about things in themselves, so you do know something about them. Right? So, um, okay, so so much for why these those are not good pictures. <laughs> um, I, I mean, so first, like that alternative. Although it's popular, it is hard to swallow. Really, I mean. People notice this problem really quickly when they read Kant. Uh, is it really possible Kant didn't notice this problem? <laughs> right. So there's other types of solutions where you try to say, well, we don't know things in themselves, but we like something else them that's kind of like knowing. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't think Kant says that anywhere, and also I'm not sure it can be made consistent. Um, so what can you say other than this? So I'm going to go back to the, okay, so first of all, what is a thing? Um, or in Latin, race, or in German, being. So um, this here, this is a traditional metaphysical understanding. Like this is an Avicenna and Thomas Aquinas and other people, yeah. including people that Kant himself read from uh, or lectured on, like Don Garden. So a thing is an entity regarded as having a certain essential quality that makes it what it is. Remember, I talked about that before. The essential quality that makes it what it is, is in Latin called it's realitas, right? It's like thingness. In English, it's called it's reality. And in German, it's called it's reality. Right? So actually, only in Latin can you see that the two naturally go together. <laughs> um, I, this is probably something I'm going to say um, uh, a lot of times in the course. I mean, Kant started out writing in Latin, actually. His early works were in Latin. And the textbooks he lectured on were in Latin. Um, he started to write in German instead. He wasn't the first person to write philosophy seriously in German. That was like mostly started by Christian Wolff. Uh, who, who wrote in both languages, but Kant himself made a transition from one to the other. And um, I think a lot of the times he's still thinking in Latin, even though he's writing in German. <laughs> um, so anyway, so a thing is an entity regarded as having a certain reality, which is a certain essential quality that makes it what it is. Now, um, Um, and I said this before, but I'm going to say it again now, and I hope it will be a little clearer. That, okay, so suppose you have a representation of something by way of its reality. So the essential quality that makes it what it is, is what your representation of it, so to speak, um, aims at. 
This is the reality of this thing, and here's my representation of it. And I represent it precisely as having the reality that it has. Now, you might want an example of this. So, I mean, I think the point of saying that we have no knowledge of things in themselves is to say there are no examples of this, <laughs> according to Kant. But like, so, but like according to Aristotelians, like how to find it to Avicenna, there are examples of this. Um, you know, like we know things like dogs by means of uh, an analog in our intellect of the form dog that's in the dog. And the form dog that's in the dog is, is the essential quality that makes it a dog, and moreover, dog is a lowest species, so they all have the same exact, you know, essential quality. And that's why a general concept is good for representing. But uh, again, so like, if you have that situation, then you can say that you're representing this thing. And now, so, The German phrase that's translated as in themselves here is on each. It doesn't mean like inside itself or something like that. It means like um, um, I mean, this is Latin, but we use it in English. It means like per se. Phrase like say and see the basically that you know equivalents of each other, itself. And this, her, or on. So, I mean, you could translate it in English as thing as itself. That is, thing as a thing. Thing as such. With this kind of representation, you represent a thing as thing. Because you represent it by way of its essential nature. And if this were enough to represent some individual object, um, then uh, um this representation would be like a rule that we have in our intellect which uh constitutes the essential nature of something outside us um So when we represented it by means of that rule, we would know it immediately as the object of that rule. We wouldn't need like sensation to come in between or anything like that, because um, um, this object would be nothing but what we represented as being. So obviously the Aristotelian case I was talking about before doesn't meet that criterion, right? And Aristotelians don't think that human intellects create their objects or anything, obviously. So, um, so I mean, like they, you'd have to get into a side question of where Kant thinks they go wrong, which he doesn't talk about that much because he's mostly focusing on his immediate predecessors. But, um, but, uh, whatever it is that is the feeling of doing wrong, um, what God is saying is that it can really work. Um, the only way it can really work is if we produce this object by knowing it. So it, it automatically is exactly what we know it is, and nothing more. And that would be what Kant calls an intellectual intuition. 
it's intellectual because it's active and it's active means that the object has to conform to the rule it wants. We demand it. Um, and it's intuition because it sort of it goes all the way to the object, it contains everything about it. Right? So, like, if we had something like this, we wouldn't learn about objects from experience. There wouldn't be anything else to learn about the object other than the way we were represented. This is basically like this is how Kant thinks that Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz are in different ways, but he especially focuses on Leibniz, are trying to somehow fit the way we actually have knowledge about objects into a picture like that. And it doesn't work because that's not the kind of intellect we have. Um, okay, so a thing in itself that is a thing as a thing is a thing as object of intellectual intuition. And this is why Although there also may be some times where Kant seems to make a distinction between these. I actually, I don't think I know of any, but I know people think that. But, um, but at least for the most part, these are treated as equivalents. So a noumenon, this part is from Newt. Remember, it's the Greek equivalent of Ecclesiastes like or of the German set time. Understand this. Uh, this one should get the last of these the understanding part. Oh, no, it's still on. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, so a noumenon is the object of a, a noose that is an intellect that is, well, I don't finish that. Um, that is an understanding. Now, wait, aren't all the objects of our cognition objects of understanding, right? Because we have sensibility and understanding together. Well, a noumenon is the object of an intellect or understanding alone without sensibility intervening. That's what it means. So, right, so an intellect that the kind of object that an intellectual, intu intellectual intuition would have would be a thing in itself. So, are there things in themselves? Um, well, um, Hunt is going to say, we don't even know how this is possible. Like, for example, we don't know what kind of, what would be the formal criterion of validity of a representation of a being like this. For us, the formal criteria, uh, criterion is that it doesn't contradict itself, right? That it doesn't have like opposites in, in the list of properties that it contains, so to speak. But this being doesn't really represent things by a list of properties. <laughs> Um, we don't know how it works. So, like, we can't say anything about the possibility of this faculty. And therefore, when we talk about things in themselves, we're talking about the object of, some, of a kind of intellect that we don't know is even possible. What? Um, was that the things in themselves? <laughs> All right. So, um, so if you ask, like, where are they? What are they like? How many are there? Um, you know, uh, you're you're talking about something that um, you can define, but you can't understand even the possibility of let alone ask, start asking questions about where they are, how many there are, or anything. So, whereas a phenomenon means that 
So the object has a certain reality that makes it what it is, but we don't represent it using that reality. We represent it using the pattern of ways it affects us. So does that mean its reality is something mysterious we don't know? No, it means its reality is something that we have to learn about from experience, <laughs> right? Bit by bit, we learn. Remember how synthetic a posteriori knowledge is possible. There's a whole that was experienced. We connect different parts of that whole in a synthetic judgment, like body and heaven. So um, we're learning something about the rule that makes the phenomenon what it is. Um, but we never represent this using that reality because we don't have it. The reality is in it. All we have is its effects on us. Um, and if you say, well, hold on a second, then how do we succeed in referring to it at all? Right? I mean, in, or in order to start learning something about it, don't we already have to know what it is? Like, I don't I have to already think it as this thing, using the quality that makes it the thing it is to learn anything? Um, and the answer is no. Our, our thoughts never relate, refer directly to objects. The last step is always an effect of the object on us. So like, um, um, so, so far in this picture, there's only a phenomenon. And we say it's merely a phenomenon. We, we're talking about the kind of um, this, Right. This is like a passive part of participle ending. Right? Like a noumenon means what is kind of like intellected, intellectified. <laughs> um so um we're talking about when we classify things as phenomena or noumena, we're classifying objects by what kind of intellectual faculty they're the object of. An intuitive one or our time, which is separate from it, the, the car, from the intuition that it uses. Um, okay, so, uh, oh my, of course, as usual, I haven't even gotten to the second point yet, and it's time is almost up. Um, there was one day when I finished it, but that's great. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, okay, so like so far, there's nothing, there's nothing mysterious at all in this picture. What is it that is affecting us? Well, I mean, of course, we can't say this in the, in the course of the transcendental uh, aesthetic because we're abstracting from things we know about the objects of our experience either a, a posteriori or through the understanding. And we're focusing just on the fact that they're, that, that, uh, they're related to, in a certain way to our pure faculty of intuition. So like we're ignoring most of what we know about them in the course of the transcendental effect. But the fact that we're ignoring it or abstracting from it doesn't mean it's not there. And if you ask, huh, okay, so what is affecting us? The answer is, well, it's bodies. How is it affecting us? Well, by means of moving forces, attractive and repulsive forces. Um, and when you say it's a phenomenon, not a human, you mean it's not the object of intellectual intuition because we don't have intellectual intuition. It's the object of um, a discursive intellect or understanding plus uh, sensible intuition. So what does Kant mean when he says that something like 
we have to be able to at least think things to themselves because other, otherwise we would be absurdly maintaining that there's something that appears that there's appearance without something that appears. So like I think the answer is that since calling it a phenomenon is talking about its relation to us. Not like what kind of thing it is, but how it's related to our faculty of cognition. There's no contradiction in saying, oh, and by the way, that same thing might be the object of a completely different fact. Mm -hmm. Or, and there's also no contradiction in saying, or something might be an object of that different faculty, but never an object of our uh, cognition. There's no contradiction. There can't be a contradiction because if there were a contradiction, that would mean that um, uh, somehow we can only think of this thing as related to our cognitive faculty. So, like, then we would be saying that there's something, that there's appearance without something that appears. But we know there is something that appears. So something that appears is not just its relationship to our cognitive faculty. I mean, that's the whole, that's why we can learn about it from experience. We can learn about it from experience because the way it happens to be related to us doesn't exhaust everything. So that if that's the case, then without any contradiction, I can say, oh, and by the way, God could know the same thing in some completely different way. Um, but as Kant will emphasize many times, just pointing out that there's no contradiction in the thought doesn't mean that we're using it to think of possible options. Because, again, like our intellectual representations, concepts, and judgments that are built out of them, whatever are no good without intuitions that complete the reference to the object. So if I if I think concepts or judgment made out of concepts about something that could never be the object of my um, cognition, because I could uh, the thing about something that could never be the object of my senses, then uh, um, it could be completely free of contradiction, and yet uh, it doesn't succeed in referring to anything even possible. It's just an empty thought that's sitting there without any way of referring to an object. So um, it must be possible to think things in themselves. Um, but it's not possible to know things in themselves, that is to represent them as even possible. So, like I said, this is harder to understand, I think, than either of those pictures I drew to begin with. But I hope it has the advantage that it's not absurd. <laughs> um, and, uh, I know this picture doesn't do justice. I mean, look, like in some sense, a picture can't do justice to them. Pictures work because they assume the form of our sensible intuition and use it to order the parts. Um, um, what we're talking about something is here is something that there couldn't be a picture of, and that's why we can't know that it's possible. Um, so this is like as close as I can come to getting across. Um, I guess I will have to talk about transcendental logic in the meaning of transcendental next time. Um, which will be, so next time will be Wednesday on Zoom. Okay, um, and I hope to see you then. Did you say Wednesday or Wednesday, right?
think that's what it says in the syllabus. And I, yeah, that, yeah, that's one of the makeup uh, lectures.